So is anybody still struggling with finding Nehemiah and where it's at? You've got to know by now. Uh, we're still going to be in there for a few more weeks, but Nehemiah is such an amazing book. And as we get into it, we realize that there is so much that we can learn from Nehemiah because he was an example, I think, to all of us. Even though he lived over 2,000 years ago, he made a lot of good decisions. And today, we're, we are going to be learning about Nehemiah and how he knew when to say no. Anybody here have a problem saying no? You just say yes way too many times? Yeah, and that's an issue, I think, with a lot of us. But Nehemiah, he knew when to say no, and he was not distracted or persuaded to say yes, when I think some of us, or maybe even many of us, uh, would be. So today, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 6, um, in the first 14 verses. But before we get into God's Word this morning, let's just bow our heads and uh, go to Him in prayer. Lord, we come before you this morning, and we just thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us and continue to do for us. Lord, this morning, as we spend time in your word, as we spend time in Nehemiah, Lord, I just pray that you would open our eyes and open our hearts. Lord, help us to not only learn um, why he did what he did, but help us, Lord, to apply it to our lives so that we, too, can follow in his, in his steps. Lord, that we would just have the wisdom that only comes from you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we know that Nehemiah, over the past several weeks, that he has no enemies, right? And everybody's his friend. Is that right? No, he has enemies. And his biggest one is probably Sanballat. And he was upset when Nehemiah came in to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he tried a lot of different tactics. Right? He tried threatening him. He tried intimidating him. Remember when he had the army surrounding Jerusalem just intimidating him? And was Nehemiah intimidated? No. No, he wasn't. In fact, he was bold, and he gathered the people in front of the, the low spots in the wall so that Sanballat and everybody else could see that they were not afraid. And so today, where we're at in Nehemiah is he's almost to the finish line. He's almost done, almost completed with his project. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I think I'm notorious in this, where I do a project, and I do it well, till about 95, 96% of the way. And then I get to a point where, oh, that's good enough. It doesn't really matter. Anybody else here? struggle with that. I, I have story upon story upon story, and I'm not going to bore you with those this morning. But so many times I get to a point where it's good enough. Well, this is where Nehemiah is at. And he is um, trying to be Sam Ballot and his buddies, as, as we'll read here. They try to trip him up at the very end. And they say that they're doing one thing, but in reality, they have false intentions, false intentions. So let's read about that. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 4 says, Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, and let us meet together in Hakafiram in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. You see here, Nehemiah, he's almost done. The wall is completely built. The gates, it looks like the gates are up, but just the doors in the gates were not yet finished. 
So he's almost there. And Sanballat sees it. And he's like, "Uh uh-oh. I think it's kind of fitting that the place that he wanted to meet was called, oh, no. You know, maybe that's what he was thinking. Oh, no. I can't believe, I can't believe they're doing it. And so he sets up a meeting and says, hey, why don't we get together? Maybe he's even thinking governor to governor. All right, you've done a great job. I'm impressed that you have, have done as well as you have. Now let us meet. Let us get together so we, dis- so we can discuss moving forward. Doesn't that sound like a good thing? Wow, Nehemiah, Nehemiah must be thinking, right? Wow, we've struggled for all this time. And now my enemies want to meet with me. Wow, this is great. We might be tempted to think that, but is that what Nehemiah thought? No, because he knew what they were up to. He knew what they were up to. It's, it's amazing how gullible I think Sanballat must have thought Nehemiah would be when he went to Nehemiah and said, hey, come, let us meet. And how many times did he send a letter? Four times. And four times Nehemiah said no because Nehemiah knew what his purpose was. Right? What was Nehemiah's purpose? Why was he there in Jerusalem? To build the wall, right? To, to rebuild Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem stood as, a, as an icon for God. And he knew that God was worthy to be praised and that uh, Jerusalem was just a direct reflection on God. And so that was his goal. And so he was not going to be distracted. He knew what his, what his purpose was. And how many times are we given a purpose and yet another offer or another opportunity comes along and we forget what our purpose was and we go to do something that may be good, but in reality, it's bad because it's not what God wants. And also, I think Nehemiah was, was thinking too that we can't get along If you remember back in chapter 2, verse 20, uh, Nehemiah replied to them, says, the God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. And maybe Nehemiah is thinking about that too. Sambalat, you have no place. We're not going to sit together. We're not going to get along because... God doesn't want us working together. And so here, Sanballat just tries and tries and tries to get him to meet with false intentions. And does Nehemiah take the bait? No. So is Sanballat going to give up? No, not yet. Not yet. He tries again. And this time, he does it with false accusations. Anybody here ever been falsely accused? Right? How many of you love it when you're falsely accused? Right? If you have a brother or a sister, I am sure that you were falsely accused. Right? Maybe you had one sibling where you always blamed that sibling for whatever happened. Yeah, maybe. I know I've been falsely accused at times because I have some siblings that no matter what, they never got in trouble. And I always seem to find it. Now, I was guilty sometimes maybe even most of the time, but there were definite times that I was, was falsely accused. And let's read how that happened. Let's read verses 5 to 9. It says, In the same way, send ballot for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I sent to him saying, No such thing as you say have been done. 
for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Right? He was falsely, he, he was being falsely accused. Now, it's interesting. Letters. The first four letters were private. This last letter was an open letter. So anybody could read it. Now, and Sam Ballot's saying, I want to help you. I want to help your reputation. So then he sends an open letter with the dirty details of this. If you were here, I have a couple of examples of this, but if you were here on uh, the weekend of Valentine's, right? February 13th, we had a, we had a play, a, we had a drama up here, and Greg was talking to that drama. Now, do you remember what he was saying? He was talking to Josh and saying, every morning I wake up with a different woman. You remember that? What happened when you heard that at the beginning of the, of the drama? I know me, when I first heard, when they were practicing, I'm like, um, what is this about? Oh, no, right? And if you only heard that first part and not the rest of it, you could think that Greg really would wake up with a different woman every single day. When in reality, he was waking up with his wife, she just every day got a little older, got a little wiser, and we all changed throughout time, right? And so the person that you first marry isn't the same person that you're married to now, even though they may have the same name and social security number and everything else. They're a different person because we grow and we change. And so it's interesting to use that and be like, wow, did you hear about Greg? He wakes up every morning. Did you hear about that? So I'm going to send him a letter. Hey, Greg. And not only do I send it, you know, in an email, I send it in an email that everybody in the church can read. Now, is that trying to help Greg at all? No. If I send an open letter out talking about the rumors about Greg and what he does, that's not the way to go about it. And in fact, a couple weeks ago, I went out to breakfast. And I went to this place, and I saw somebody from our church. And they waved me over. I said, hey, how's it going? And I looked at them, and I looked over at who they were sitting with. And it was not their spouse. And I didn't know who that other person was. And so instantly, just with, with where my mind goes, who is this that they're with? This is not their spouse. Did I just walk into something? And so here, I'm, my mind's going, you know, because I'm, because I'm a sinner and, and I'm carnal. This is not good. What do I do? How do I respond? Should I ask who this person is? What if I don't like the answer? What, what if I don't like the answer? What am I going to do? And so I was really nervous. And, and I had another meeting to get to. And, I, and so I met with, with the other person. The whole time I'm thinking, oh no, why is this happening? And later on that, that day, I ended up talking with the spouse. I was like, hey, I want to talk to you. This happened today, and I just want to know. And like, oh, I didn't know they were going out for breakfast. Uh-oh, now, now I'm in trouble. And we haven't really had a chance to connect today because we're, we're busy doing stuff. And I'm just like, oh, I... I'm praying it was, it, it was a sibling or something. And come to find out, yes, they were having breakfast with their sibling, which is okay, all right? There's no issues. You can go to breakfast with a sibling, not a problem. But what an opportunity for me to spread rumors. Hey, did you hear so-and-so was having breakfast with somebody who they are not married to? Wow, how much damage could that have done? It could have done a lot of damage. Although, I think if, if those of you who know the, the people involved, you would have been like, oh, pff, we knew better. There's no way that that would have happened. And just how we need to be careful with rumors because they start out small. And you see how Sanballat worded it too. 
He says, oh, there are these rumors. Also, Geshem, he also says it too. Now let's get together. And a couple other things he was saying is that he was planning, right? What, what are some of the things that he was accusing Nehemiah of? One was planning a rebellion. Nehemiah, people are talking. They say the reason you're doing this is to plan a rebellion. And not only are you planning a rebellion, but you're planning to be king. Now, how smart would that have been for Nehemiah to just rebuild Jerusalem and then immediately start a rebellion and consider himself as being king? That would have been, I think, ridiculous because there's no army. And going up against King Artaxerxes, right? And so Nehemiah responds and basically says, you're out of your mind. These days we might, we might even say, what are you smoking? Right? What are you taking? What, what medication are you on? You're, you're crazy. You're just making this up. And he was able to get away with it because character protects reputation. Doesn't it? If you know the people involved, your character protects any slander that comes your way until your character is taken down. Recently, over the past, well, it's just been just a little over a year, there was a leader, not necessarily in the church, but very influential leader in the Christian world. And he did some questionable stuff, but people, no, he's a great character. These, these are just rumors. Until it came out that these rumors were actually true. And then his character went away. There's, there's somebody I know who, you know, at the time, character was great, phenomenal. And people would come to me and say, hey, this person said this or this person said that. And I didn't believe them. Even friends would come to me and say, no, I, I wouldn't believe them because I knew this person's character. Nothing they could say or do could persuade me until I actually saw it for myself. And that the character that I thought, because I thought I knew this person, it was just a facade. And they were really good at it. But once I saw through, I realized that those things that my, my friends have told me, that they were actually true. Character protects reputation. And so that's a question that we need to ask ourselves, is what kind of character do you have? This morning, even in Sunday school, we're talking, we're going through Philippians in Sunday school, and just how we as Christians, we can't separate, should not separate our, our faith from our life. And that while our, let me try to remember this correctly, while our relationship with Christ is a private relationship, our actions should be public. We shouldn't be hiding our faith in Christ from those around us. We shouldn't believe or say we believe one thing privately, but yet live another life. Because Nehemiah, he was outstanding. And of course, his reputation with the king, if Nehemiah had any character faults, right? If, if it was even partially believable that he would be planning a rebellion and that he was planning to be king, don't you think King Artaxerxes would know, having had such a close relationship with him? Artaxerxes knew even when Nehemiah was sad. So he knew a lot about him. And so Nehemiah's character came into play here. So when he was attacked, did he go about defending himself and say, whoa, 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 no, that's not true. Hey, everybody, listen up. I'm not planning those things. Did he defend himself? No, he basically just shrugged, shrugged it off and told Sam Ballot, you're a liar. What you're saying isn't true. You are just making this up. He doesn't even go into really a debate in fighting Sam Ballot with these accusations. He's just doing his own thing. And the other thing that's interesting, too, with the accusations of the, with, with Nehemiah having the prophets and being the king, is 
were the Jews looking for a king at this time? Yeah, they've been waiting for the promised one. Even when, when Jesus came, right? They're looking for a king. So it's, it's plausible. This is a believable rumor that Sambalat is saying. But it's not believable because of who he's saying it about. Nehemiah was not in it for glory, in it for himself. And so we see uh, Sanballat, I think, getting frustrated because he wanted to scare Nehemiah and he wanted them to stop the work. He wanted him to stop the work. Well, then this trio, they go another route because accusing him of false in, or having false intentions and in trying to meet with him didn't work. And Sambala, he spreads this rumor and says, hey, let's meet, let's talk about it because I want to help you out. Isn't that ridiculous? I'm going to slander you. And then in the same breath, I'm going to say, let's talk this out. Let's come up with a battle plan. And Nehemiah doesn't fall for it. Well, then they use false prophets. Now, a prophet was somebody who spoke to the people from what God said. God would speak to the prophet, and then the prophet would speak to the people. And there were obviously true prophets and false prophets. And the difference between the two, how could you tell the difference between a true prophet from a false prophet? Well, a true prophet always followed God. And there were even tests. If a prophet said, hey, this is going to happen, but it didn't happen, what was to happen to that prophet? In the Old Testament, they should have been stoned to death. They were to die because God has no room for false prophets. And so here we see that Sam Ballot is trying to use false prophets in order to trip up Nehemiah. So let's read here verses 10 to 14. It says, so now when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man shall as I uh, such as I, could go into the temple and live. I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in this way in sin, and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, O oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So it wasn't just one prophet. It was several prophets that didn't want Nehemiah doing what he was doing. And at least the one here, um, Shemaiah, the reason he was a false prophet was for money. Do good people do bad things for money, right? Some of us will do anything for a dollar. When I was a kid, I would do all sorts of things for pocket change, such as eating spiders and ants and even had a butterfly one time until the, the principal saw me and I had to spit it out. But isn't it crazy the things you do for 60 cents? You know, now inflation has gone out, so, you know, my price probably would have been a little bit higher. And I'm a little more mature than I was back then as well. But I think we all have done things that we regret doing. And maybe we did it for money. Maybe we did it for reputation, uh, for friends or whatnot. Maybe we did it just because we were dared to. And uh, it's going on. But these prophets, they did it for money. Now, how did Nehemiah know that Shemaiah was a false prophet? Well, for one... Shemaiah said, hey, let's hide in the temple. It's a good place. It's fortified. It's, it's, it's built up. You'll be safe in there. Now, question, would Nehemiah 
had been safe in the temple? Yeah, probably would have been safe. But is that what God wanted him to do? No, No. because if you look, we won't look back there, but Numbers 18.7, it says that any non-priest will die if you enter into the, into the temple. It was, it was a very specific, special area that Nehemiah was not allowed to go. So why, while it sounded like a good idea or may have been tempting, Nehemiah said, whoa, hey, if I go in there, not only am I going to die, but also uh, it's not going to look good. There's actually, in fact, in, in 2 Chronicles 26, we read about King Uzziah. And he actually went into the temple in order to burn incense. And he was told, no, you're not supposed to do that. And he was, he was blessed because you know, God had mercy on him because he didn't die immediately. But immediately he had leprosy on his head, on his forehead, right there. And if you're unaware of leprosy, it's a, it's a skin disease that kills off your skin, and it can get so bad that your body parts can end up rotting away and falling off. And if you had leprosy, you had to be outside of the community. You had to live outside the city walls, and you couldn't have interaction with people around you. And so then his son had, had to reign in his place. So Nehemiah knew that it was wrong because the advice that Shemaiah was giving him was in contradiction to God's word. And not only that, but a false prophet, right, gives a different message. In this day and age, do we have a lot of false prophets? Do we have people saying, hey, I have a message from God, and it tells me, yeah, he tells me to tell you to do this or that. And people are led astray. How are people led astray by false prophets? It's because they don't know the truth, right? And I, and I encourage you, right? Don't just take my word for it, right? Because I may come up here one day and say something totally crazy, totally ridiculous. And if you don't know what the Bible says, you may be inclined to believe it. Now, who here wants to be a fool and believe a lie? Good, no hands up. That's a good thing. But you're only going to know if you study the truth. It's like a counterfeit bill. How, you know, some bills are look really good. They, they, they're really good counterfeit bills. But unless you study the true bills, you're not going to know a counterfeit when you see one. The same thing with God's word. And also we read here that it would also discredit Nehemiah because what has Nehemiah been telling the people of Jerusalem for so long? Oh no, Sambalat has an army coming to get you. He says, oh no, we can't, we can't fight against them. Is that what Nehemiah says? No, Nehemiah says, don't worry about it because God is going to protect you, right? God is going to fight for you. And so now what, it would, now what, it, what would it look like? Shemaiah says, hey, Nehemiah, they're coming out to get you. Even tonight, they're going to come to kill you. Nehemiah has an opportunity to respond. He can either stand firm and says, you know what? No, I'm here doing what God wants. I'm not going to run away. Because if I tell people to stand strong, and then when my life is in danger, I run away? What kind of a message would that leave? If, if Nehemiah, even if it was okay for him to hide in the temple, if he would have done that, what kind of a message would it have sent to everybody else? Wow. I cannot believe he did that. Here he is asking us to risk our lives and yet he's not willing to do the same? Wouldn't that discredit any leader? If if your leader is saying one thing, but doing another, is that a leader you want to follow? 
I hope not. Now, granted, people are sinners and they make mistakes, right? We all make mistakes, but it's what we do with them. And so through here, going through Nehemiah in this passage here in, in, in chapter 6, we see how Nehemiah said no to three different, uh, three different times to three different things. And the first uh, situation where we need to say no is we need to say no when you're asked to do something that takes you away from serving God. If you're doing what God wants you to do and another opportunity comes along that keeps you from doing what God wants you to do, even if it's a, a good thing, even if it's a socially acceptable thing, is that the thing that you should say yes to or that you should say no to? It's something you should say no to. Now, there are a lot of things, specifically in, in, in our day and age, but even throughout history, there's always things to distract us from doing what God wants us to do, whether it's family or, or friends or job or money or sports or TV or whatever it is, internet, social media. So many different things are out there that may not be bad, but if it keeps us from doing what God wants us to do, then is it bad? And some of us need to learn to say no at certain points because, yes, it may be something good, but if it's not what God wants us to do, we need to say no. The second thing that we can learn from here from Nehemiah about saying no is we need to say no when you're asked to fear man more than God. Right? When you're asked to play it safe. Don't say this. Don't do that. Because if you do, you're going to have a target on your back. You won't have the help. You won't have the support that you currently have. And sometimes, right, do people ever make decisions based upon fear of what might happen to them? Whether it's reputation or friends or monetary? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes we make our decisions based on fear. When in reality, we need to make our decisions based on fear, but the fear of God. God, not the fear of man. And a, a lot of us had to make decisions a while back, and I'm not sure if it's still in play. I don't hear it as much. But there were people all over the, the world and, and country who had to make a medical decision. And some of them said, yeah, I believe it's wrong, but I don't want to lose my job, so I'm going to make this decision to do it. And that's Again, it's your decision, but why did you make it? Did you make it because you believed it was okay? That's fine. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you believed it was wrong, but you made that decision because of your fear for your job, you know, that's, that's a different situation. But if you didn't make that decision, if you said no because of your faith, see, that's what God, that's what God wants us to to do. And there's a difference between what we prefer besides a, a conviction, right? A, an opinion is something that can change. And you may have an opinion about something and then later on you realize, oh, you know what? That was an invalid opinion. That doesn't make sense. I, I agree, I change. Whereas a conviction is something that takes longer to change, right? Because convictions can change. I was... I been, uh, I've had convictions growing up where I, that is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong. And then growing up, you're like, you know what, maybe it's not as wrong as I thought it was. And I'm talking about things as far as like the, uh, the make of a car. Some, some makes are just bad. Never going to touch them. Uh-uh. And then I grow up, well, maybe that was a wrong, maybe that was a wrong conviction. And, and we wade through that. Right? but we need to say no when we're asked to fear man more than God because that's what Nehemiah did. 
If he would have feared man more than God, he would have said yes several times, I think. And the third thing that we can learn when to say no is when you're asked to do something that is contrary to God's word. That is hard sometimes because God's word, there's a lot of things in God's word that says what we should do and what we shouldn't do, right? There's a lot of black and white and we believe in those black and white until somebody we know and love moves over and lives in the gray area and we're like, well, you know what? I know God says this, but I love this person. So, I'm going to kind of ignore that part of the Bible because I love this person. And besides, God tells us to love people. Therefore, what I'm doing is right, and we can justify our decisions. But if you are ever asked to do something that's contrary to God's word, no matter how well-intentioned it is, is that something that you should say yes to? No. Even if it hurts people's feelings, Who here loves hurting people's feelings? Really? No hands? I thought maybe if you had a brother or sister, because sometimes it's great to hurt their feelings. right? Or when we're in an argument and somebody hurts our feelings, what do we do? We go back and we try to hurt their feelings, right? And, And we attack them. But we need to hold true to God's word. And God's word is being attacked every single day, isn't it? And if you stand up for God's word, you are going to be attacked. But what's better, being attacked for doing the right thing or being attacked because you didn't hold to your principles? You didn't hold to what the Bible says. These are decisions that we need to make every single day. Whether, whether what we're going to decide is whether to follow God or follow man. And here we have an incredible example how Nehemiah was was threatened with wealth, with prestige, right? Say, hey, you can have this. Just come meet with me. Do this. Get distracted from your work because don't complete your job. You're you're good enough. You're close enough. You're 99% of the way done with your job. But no, Nehemiah stayed true to his task and he stayed true to his God. So let that be an example for all of us. And this week, you're going to be asked a lot of questions. You're going to be asked to do this or do that. You're going to be tempted to do this or do that. How are you going to respond? Are you going to say no? Or are you going to say yes? And I pray that if it's cut and dry, that you would say no to the good things, but say yes to the best things. Let's pray.